Okay. So we'll yeah. go online. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second lecture of this year's winter lecture series on energy issues in East Asia. My name is Yan Chiu Wen from the Program on the Environment. This lecture series is co-sponsored by the Program on the Environment and the Taiwan Studies Program. We would also like to thank the Office of, Office of Global Affairs for their support. All these videos and lecture recordings will be available on the Taiwan Studies YouTube channel for your future viewing. Our speaker today is Dr. Pei Wen Lu from National Zhanghua University of Education. Dr. Lu has extensive background in urban planning, climate resilience, and sustainability studies. Her research focuses on strategies for flood resilient communities, both in Taiwan and in Europe. Today, she will share with us her recent research on offshore wind power development in Taiwan and talk about its spatial impact. Let's welcome Dr. Pei Wen Lu. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Wong. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pei Wen Lu. I'm an associate professor in National Zhanghua University of Education. And uh, please forgive my um, my eyes because it's early morning in Taiwan. <laughs> yeah. So uh, today I will share with you uh, what is happening in Taiwan uh, concerning the offshore wind farm development. And as Professor Wong already um, introduced, um, I'm a planner specialized in uh, climate change issue, especially in flooding and recently in the energy issue. So um, yeah, let's, uh, let's start. Um, yeah, this slide, uh, just, uh, just uh, uh, a little intro uh, introduction for myself. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, now I'm working in National Zhanghua University of Education. Uh, um, yeah, and my research focus is about spatial planning, urban design, climate adaptation, resilience, and uh, the participatory in photo sensing that is a part of the PPGIS techniques. And yeah, I have um, uh, I have my multiple background concerning geography, architecture, and urban planning. So yeah, let's start our our talk today. Um, uh, yeah, today's talk I will divide it in two parts. The first part is uh, is more a uh, smaller part talking about. Uh, the transboundary marine spatial planning that is more related to our assignment. And in this part, I will introduce uh, I will introduce to you about the European spatial planning approach, what is spatial planning and in referring to marine spatial planning or maybe uh, some of the scholars talking about marine time spatial planning. And, uh, and there is a transition from marine spatial planning to transboundary marine marine spatial planning. Uh, this is more like a theoretical background, theoretical framework, help us to, uh, to view the situation in Taiwan, what we are missing, or what is the, uh, the, the opportunity of, as well as the threat, um, yeah, the threat, uh, yeah, what we facing. Yeah, so this, uh, this, is the fir uh, this is the first part. And then uh, the major part in this talk it's about the uh, uh, offshore wind farm development in Taiwan. As I mentioned before, I'm a planner specialized in uh, environmental issues. So uh, my talk will uh, basically uh, viewing from the perspective of spatial planning. Uh, that is really about uh, uh, spatial impact, spatial uh, resource management. So it's really from this angle. And this uh, this talk will divide it in three different um, sections. Yeah, the first one is about uh, the situation, uh, the viewing Taiwan with global lens. Uh, that is, uh, I I try to introduce uh, what is uh, our um, our benefit. Yeah, out of our advantage, environmental advantage, uh, concerning the development of offshore wind farm. And then uh, I will uh, I will talking about uh, the policy and uh, the practice. What is going on? What is happening in Taiwan so far? And then um, uh, the, the 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 last part is more like concluding remarks, talking about the challenge from the planning perspective. 
So this is really a, a, a speech of planning. So um, hope you enjoy it. Okay, uh, so let's go to the first part, um, part one and the first slide. Um, in uh, spatial planning actually is a European approach. Um, there is a lot of diagram in these slides. Uh, can you see my angle? I think it's, it's okay, yeah. Uh, spatial planning, the ideas of uh, collaboration in policy making has been addressed in Europe since the early 1990s. At the time, there, uh, the policymakers, planners and policymakers realized there is a lot of uncertainties um, um, in relation to like in economic crisis. Um, nature disaster, for example. So uh, the development has no longer be able to, um, to, to, to address from what we are planned. So it's like planned and the situation, there's a mismatch between planning and uh, the practice. So at, um, uh, gradually a policymaker realized it, it will be easier to make a diagram like the diagram, instead of the uh, precisely land use plan, make a diagram and to raise up the conversation, raise up the collaboration, to invite different actors to participate. So that's the beginning, and uh, that that is the core of spatial planning. Uh, as you meant, uh, as you see in the slides, you will see this is the European graphs um, addressed like in late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, uh, yeah, it is very clear. These graphs, this these circles, uh, is talking about the cluster of the cities, not really the precisely circles mentioned about land use management. Uh, and there's another um, uh, very important uh, diagram that's called blue banana. In this in this diagram, is black and white, but uh, if you Google it, actually it, it's blue. So there's a blue banana uh, address in the 1990s to direct the uh, spatial planning in the Europe. And um, this blue banana actually is a, a represent a corridor, the, the, the European corridor. And there are lots of, uh, um, lots of spatial planning projects. For example, like the Eurostar, you know, the, 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 there is high-speed rail from Paris to London, right? Uh, this, uh, this is directed by this uh, vision, like the spatial planning as a vision, and uh, leave the details of implementation uh, to, the, to the nations. And so that is a, there is a transition um, in planning policymaking. Uh, there's no longer of just focus about uh, land use management, but we are more um, interested or we are more, uh, we take more rooms for more conversation, more uh, collaboration, more talk to each other. And yeah, we are uh, more open for different actors to participate. So um, um, this is the uh, London, Paris, Milan, Milchen, Hamburg, Pentagon. So it, it, it's again, it's a diagram. This diagram is trying to uh, raise up the conversation. And this is uh, this is so far uh, what direct the, the, the spatial development in Europe. Uh, it's red octopus. You see, there is a blue uh, banana, and all the countries they trying to uh, engage in this corridor. So you see the red octopus uh, so far. Yeah. So um, what? Why I uh, mentioned this is to uh, to highlight the importance of conversation. In, uh, re in referring to spatial planning. Uh, in, this, in, this, in, in this perspective, um, uh, this map actually is diagrammed, and this diagram is to raise up conversation, to provide long-term visions and open rooms for detail of implementations. Um, so that is basically what we, um, what, we, what we have, and that's what we, uh, what, Plan planners now so they are um, uh, taking care of it. So uh, you you can you can you can have these kind of ideas in different terms like spatial planning, normative planning, collaborative planning, or strategic 
planning, strategic spatial planning. So there's uh, a lot of uh, different terms, but they all referring to this kind of conversation, this kind of the highlight of conversation. Um, yeah, there's um, uh, in referring to the sea. It's also in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, approach in this track. This is a diagram talking about the Baltic region, the Baltic Sea, uh, when they trying to um, uh, trying to make a marine spatial plan. They trying to um, manage the marine resources in the um, in the early two thousands. Um, they make this diagram. Is like um, as I mentioned before, this kind of the circle and with the electricity icons. Uh, this is the ideal wind farm area, and then, uh, but this is the just the the concept of the wind farm area, and then uh, all the corridors for shipping for different passage, and then some of the some of them are the biodiversity uh, biodiversity sites is to uh, need to be protected. And there's some com conflict zone, as you mentioned here. So this becomes a way for different actors, uh, also in in the European context, different countries, to to really sit and talk to each other, trying to negotiate to find a way which is not really satisfied for everyone, but everyone is okay for that. So spatial planning uh, approach is also used in coping with uh, the other resources in the seas like this. And uh, once they make, a, uh, make a, a diagram like that, then go back to each country's, uh, each country's make a plan that is marine time spatial plan. This is the marine, uh, the marine spatial planning plan in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, for this, uh, this is uh, this is really under the spatial scope. It is really about zoning. It's it, it's it's zoning. It's really precisely for that area for that land use management. So uh, that's that is the way when uh, that is way for European um, scholars, Euro European planners, to make this marine time uh, spatial land use management is like in this way. So you see there is a level of the, uh, the European level talking about the visions and diagrams, and there's a national level talking about the implementation of land use management. And at that time in the early 2000s, um, uh, the European context, they have the marine spatial planning, as I mentioned before in the previous slides. And there is another project talking, uh, it's, it's about integrated coastal zone management, ICZN. That is uh, trying to raise up the conversation, as I, uh, yeah, as I uh, emphasize, uh, raise up the conversation to uh, welcome different actors to participate. And when talking about the, the offshore wind farm development, like the fishing, uh, the fishing associations, for example, and uh, uh, the, the NGOs for environmental protections, and also for uh, the energy developers. So it's like different groups of participate, uh, uh, different group of actors, they participate in this contact. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so for offshore wind farm development, uh, it's, it's of course uh, in the sea, right? So, um, so it is different from, uh, from land use management for the land, for planning for the land, we can, we can very easy to have an excursion, have a field work, and to go there to see what's going on. But for the sea, actually, it's uh, it's far, uh, it's quite difficult. And yeah, planners, uh, some of the uh, yeah, some some of the planners have the excursion for 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 the precisely area. But most of the plan is made uh, uh, based on the scientific. Uh, scientific information we got. So the GIS framework and uh, uh, the, the platform for uh, ecological resources that become very, very important when facing, uh, uh, when talking about the offshore wind farm development. So this is, the, uh, this is the EMU, the Ecological Marine Units, actually is the foundation of this talk. Um, because we need to know what is happening in this area and then we can have our conversation, right? Yeah. So
So, um, so in our assignment, we're talking about marine spatial planning and also transboundary marine spatial planning. Uh, actually, it's uh, it uh, it different in terms of the the, the participated countries. Yeah. So the transboundary marine spatial planning, uh, in a sense, is like a combination between marine spatial planning I mentioned before, and also the ICZM, the Integrated uh, Coastal Zone Management. Um, this kind of combination focus not only spatial, but also temporal dimension of policymaking. It, it, uh, it uh, talking about uh, uh, sea resources management, um, in phases, like phase one, what is uh, important, what should be protected, what is uh, what is the conflict hotspots, yeah. And phase two, how we manage it and transform, transit this development from phase one to phase two and to another phases. So um, rather than leading to a joint marine spatial plan, uh, transboundary spatial planning, uh, marine spatial planning is more a continuous process continuing process of transboundary cooperation. So the, uh, the core uh, essence remains that like participation, collaboration, negotiation, this, this remain, but uh, we are having, uh, they are having, not, my, not me, they are having more, um, more uh, actors, cross-boundary actors. They are have multiple uh, nations to participate, to. Uh, to to talk to each other, yeah. Okay, that is so far um, uh, what we have, uh, what they have in in the European context, and that is also uh, the the yeah the highlights of our assignments. So uh, later in the uh, yeah later on I will have uh, have a talk about the situation in Taiwan and its spatial impact. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. The 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 uh, the diagram. The yeah, the diagram above is the global wind atlas. You can uh, you can see Taiwan is here, is in the tropical area, but we have a strong wind speed. Uh, uh, the color here, purple, is the uh, strongest wind speed, and uh, turn to uh, relate uh, gradually turn to yellow and green. So in Taiwan, uh, you see um, you see we have a strong wind, yeah. And of course, strong wind is the, um, the beginning of the, the niche for offshore wind farm development, yeah. And in Taiwan, um, yeah, uh, if we zoom in uh, to this area, uh, you see Taiwan, especially in the western coast it's very very uh windy yeah uh taiwan in general the the whole island in general has strong uh, great potential for offshore wind farm development the general um uh, wind speed for electricity is seven it's around 700 718 watts per square meter especially in Zhanghua overseas where my university located Zhanghua here uh the wind speed is reached to 1500, yeah. So it's like double of the general um, wind speed. The, so it's, it has a very great potential for offshore wind farm development. And when most of the wind comes from the, the um, eastern, uh, northeast areas, from, 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 the, from the north. And during the winter time, of course, it's very windy. And um, it it causes the uh, uh, yeah causes ship a difficult of uh, of shipping, but uh, in terms of the offshore wind farm development, it becomes our potential, our opportunity for this. Uh, uh, last week, Professor Chen already uh, have um, uh, have a comparison between uh, the uh, of uh, of the energy issue uh, the renewal uh, renewable energy issues between uh, Korean Japan and Taiwan uh, this uh, this are the, uh, this is the map for uh, four 
different uh, different countries for different areas uh, uh, in Eastern Asia. Uh, they are very keen in developing the offshore wind farm. The, uh, yeah, the offshore wind uh, development. Yeah. So you see, this is Korea, South Korea. Uh, it's about 500 in average. The, the wind speed, the potential for electricity is about 500 speed, uh, 500, yeah. And this is Japan. Uh, the northern part of Japan is higher, yeah. In average, is like 700. If you still remember what the, what the numbers in Taiwan, you see, um, yeah, especially for for the um, for the western coast in Zhanghua area, is much uh, greater than that. And this is Fujian. In China, in this site is around 500, a, a bit less than uh, the numbers in Korea. And then this is Vietnam. Vietnam is another country is very keen to have this offshore wind farm development, and it's about it's uh, almost 500. It's like 482. Yeah. So uh, environmental speaking, we have a great potential for that, and. Uh, and for actually for wind farm development, it's not just about wind speed. It also about the um, how to call that uh, the elevation in deep. Yeah, in Taiwan we in this area. This is Zhanghua, and this is the uh, very windy area. <laughs> yeah, and this line, this dot line, is five uh, fifty meters in deep. The, the, the elevate, uh, elevation line, five meters in deep. So uh, we have a shallow sea in this area. So we have a strong wind and we have shallow sea. Uh, that is very good for developers, for, for these developers, because the, 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 um, the deep of the, of the sea, uh, it's about the, the construction. Right. So if we have a shallow deep, a shallow sea, that means they need they don't need to invest um, so much in construction, and they can uh, easily easier to go to the foundation. So uh, uh, the strong wind and the shallow sea make this area very good for for offshore wind farm development. Um, actually, for the four sea shore, there is a very uh, important. Uh, review sectors. They say uh, Taiwan is prior, prior, prior around the world, prior to offshore wind farm development, especially in East Asia, uh, in terms of the wind speed and in terms of the geological condition. And that is about the environmental uh, situation, our uh, geographical situation. And in terms of the institutions, in terms of uh, the planning situation, in terms of the, uh, the, the ideas of spatial development, we also, uh, now today, we also uh, reached the point uh, when nuclear, uh, no, sorry, new renewable energy development is not just, um, uh, it is the things which must do. Uh, uh, if, if we review this uh, policy, uh, the, the development of the policy, uh, there are different, there are some times, uh, some tips, which is very important. Uh, in 2012, the first um, uh, important edge is 2012. Uh, in 2011, uh, in Japan, the Fush, uh, Fukushima, yeah, Fukushima nuclear disasters, uh, uh, Due to the tsunami, uh, tsunami uh, in Japan, uh, uh, because it's very severe, it caused a rethink of nuclear energy safety. Uh, in Taiwan, um, it's like we, we certainly realize, um, even in Japan, uh, when, when facing the disaster, environmental disaster, when facing the earthquake, tsunami, and even in Japan, they uh, the the nuclear power plant could be destroyed. And that caused a lot of problem uh, in uh, in the country. Yeah, so that's raise up the uh, the awareness, the public awareness to talk uh, to say no more Fukushima. We we don't we don't want nuclear power plant anymore. That becomes a public awareness. So you uh, the 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 pictures in um, 
below. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, the protest, public protest, uh, uh, in Taipei and also in different country, uh, different cities in Taiwan. Uh, there, the uh, the public, the the people, people go to the streets and to protect and say we don't need nuclear power plant anymore. And that is 2011, so it's like 10 years, a bit more than, yeah, 10 years ago. So, um, uh, so after, uh, yeah, raising, uh, because of this raising public awareness, um, the government, the national government at that time, uh, this uh, KMT party, uh, to increase, uh, they trying to increase the diversity of energy resources. They, uh, they, they start to think uh, maybe, we uh, in uh, in addition to the nuclear power um, uh, power uh, uh, energy use, maybe we need more more uh, more uh, source for this. So uh, to increase the diversity of energy resources and also to be more resilient in energy issue, of course, the the Bureau of Energy Ministry of Economic Affairs. So that is at the national level, the Bureau of Energy. Uh, they launch a project which is very long, millions of solar power roofs, thousands of offshore onshore turbine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the title is very long, but uh, yeah, uh, you can you can uh, understand it as a slogan. They, uh, they trying to present their uh, 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 intention to, uh, to, to this renewable energy development. This is in 2012. Uh, like one years uh, after the, the the Fukushima disaster, um, yeah, and at that time uh, the national government starts to uh, considering the offshore wind power development, and at that time they start to realize, wow, the western coast in Taiwan, the uh, the Taiwan Strait, we have a great power, uh, a great potential for this, and. Uh, later on, it's also in 2012, uh, the national government announced uh, the location for phase one pilot project. I, I will mention the, the different phases later. Yeah. So that is uh, that is start point. This is the beginning of our offshore wind power development uh, from the uh, institutional perspectives. So uh, there is another important time in 2016. And the DPP, uh, uh, when, when the DPP party won the president elections in 2016, pre uh, President Tsai, as I, I put his, uh, I put her photos here. Uh, this is our current president. Uh, uh, they win, uh, they won the election. And because uh, before the election, they has already uh, yeah, has has already present their political commitment for no nuclear power usage. So uh, this Thai government need to fulfill their commitment. So that is uh, that that is the um, political turn for this. And uh, 2016 is um, it's also uh, an another reason to raise up this uh, this kind of debate uh, it's about the Paris Agreement, uh, the UNFPC, yeah, 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 they, <laughs> yeah, the Paris Agreement, um, uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> most of the, um, many of the country um, assign this agreement for this renewable energy uses, the transition of energy usage, and because uh, even Taiwan is not able to participate, Directly to the to the to the meeting, uh, we follow this. So uh, we see there is an international uh, atmosphere for this renewable energy transition, and uh, also our political commitment for this one. So um, these two things speeded, yeah, speed up this uh, this transition. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, energy transition become became a most do things internationally and also politically. So this Thai government take it as a critical policy presentation. And, and this is our uh, target, our goal for energy transition. Um, they are uh, 
three checkpoints. Uh, yeah, the first checkpoint is uh, start for energy transition. Uh, it started in 2016, as I mentioned, the DPP government, the Thai government, start to fulfill their political commitment trying to do this. So, um, uh, strategically speaking, uh, uh, the idea is to reducing the renewable energy uses and to until 2025, ideal, uh, we expect to use the re, uh, nuclear uh, power less than 1% for what we need. And then trying to raise up the renew, renewable energy usage and to reach to like, yeah. 20% of renewable energy. So uh, that is the that is the our target. Our target in 2025 is 20% of renewable energy, 27% of coal-fired energy, and 50% of gas-fired energy and others. And um that is a great debate of gas, 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 yeah, gas in this uh, thin black line. Yeah. Uh, uh, because gas fire is also um, is is also the uh, it's a cleaner but it's still fired energy. Um, but uh, but we try uh, because of the renewable energy, uh, the great uh, the the yeah the challenge of renewable energy is uh, is uncertain, right? It's, it's about its uncertainty. So uh, we're trying to have this gas fire energy, trying to stabilize to stable. Uh, this uh, energy supply supply issue. Yeah, so uh, in 2016 to 2021, that is last year, uh, it's the phase of energy transition, trying to make this transition. And uh, from planning perspective, for, from land use perspective, there are lots of um, like gas receiving station. The port was uh, under the instruction uh, installation and uh, some of the debate is talking about that, but it's it's the phase of energy transition. And start from last year, we we reached the second checkpoint, that is net zero emission, entitled net zero emissions, and uh, it's more like um, trying to uh, raise up, speed up the, the 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 capacity of renewable energy. And then uh, finally, um, ideally, we, we expect it to reach the, the third checkpoint is clean energy oriented. But even in this stage, even 2025, it's like, um, it's like 50%. Uh, yeah, it's the target is like that. It's not 100% renewable energy, but it's like a more transition, more en uh, renewable energy uses in this area. And so far, so far, um, our en uh, renewable energy is like less than 10%. So it's still a long way to go and we need to go. Uh, yeah, uh, this is from the uh, policy perspective and from the uh, uh, international market inspect of, in the from the perspective of international market, actually clean energy is very important for the business in Taiwan as your as you may know, Taiwan uh, is very small island, so we are, our economy is very depends on international market. Yeah, and um, and we have a lot of chips, right? We produce chip, not the potato chips you eat in at home, but the the chip in your mobile. Uh, yeah, because of this uh, uh, this firm like Apple or like Google, they are all talking about the RE one hundred. Uh, talking about the 100% clean energy um, use in all this manufacturing trend. So uh, 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 they uh, require the supply chain to 100% uh, to use the clean energy. So that's why the TSMC uh, and other uh, factories, at other companies, they really need uh, to, to use clean energy, to use renewable energy in order to remain in this supply chain. So energy transition uh, is also a matter of Taiwan's international competitiveness. This clean energy may not necessarily use for our domestic uh, daily living, but it's very important for our, um, for our economy. Yeah. 
And for this, uh, uh, from the environmental perspective, planning perspective, and also the market perspective, uh, I think you already understand why this uh, of showing from developments is must to do, huh? Must it must we we must have that? Yeah. So uh, the government uh, divided our uh, offshore wind farm development in three phases. They like three phases. Everything is three phases. The phase one is the pilot project I mentioned before in 2012, right? Uh, they assigned two locations for pilot project. One is in Miaoli and another is in Zhanghua. I will show the map later on. And uh, this phase one, the, the two project is already accomplished and it's operated uh, so far and in 2015 yeah start from the 15 2015 uh, they reached to phase two that is potential sites talking about potential sites which means uh, the planner the uh, the, uh, the government assigned the area as potential sites and welcome uh, external or internal developers to invest. Uh, that this phase, uh, so far we are in this phase, and this phase start in the in the fifteen, and uh, the onshore onshore construction is already accomplished. The offshore construction is is ongoing, and we expect it to have it uh, to to operate it all this uh, offshore wind farm uh, in two thousand fifteen, and. At that time, we can raise up, uh, really speed up our energy use, the curve of that uh, renewable energy use. And then uh, now today, so far, we start to have our uh, phase three that is uh, called block development. In phase three, um, uh, there's the, there's a uh, there's a different in terms of um, phase two and phase three. In phase two, the government assign the potential sites and invest the uh, in and welcome for the uh, investment. But in phase three, it's not a site area, but it's for the developers to uh, to 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 choose where they prefer to develop, and then uh, the government review the. The, the their proposal and to see whether it's okay or not okay it's go or no go so uh, uh there is uh you in this in this different phases you see different um different ways of thinking different ways of doing things and um it's it's interesting from from for planners for me it's interesting because the phase two the potential side the government assigned the location is uh, more or less the European uh, continent, uh, the, the, the national, uh, the government of European continent, uh, this is what they are doing they, in this way. And phase three is like the government, uh, the developers make the proposal for, for review. Uh, it's more, more or less uh, what is happening in the UK. So you also see a combination of different ways of thinking and the different ways of develop. Okay. So that is so far uh, what have um, uh, This is phase one. If we see the one, that is phase one. In phase one, we have two uh, offshore wind farms. Uh, one is in Miaoli here, and another is in Zhanghua, Tai Power Zhanghua. Yeah. And the capacity actually is not that much, but uh, that's the beginning part, and it's very close to the coastal area. And then, uh, so far, we are in phase two. So we have different uh, offshore wind farm located and mapping in and mapping here. Uh, most of them are in Zhanghua. It's about seventy percent of the offshore wind farms located in Zhanghua uh, and overseas. Yeah, some of them are uh, very close to the coast, and others like. Uh, Austro, uh, yeah, the Austro, the the Austro wind farm is is a bit far. We need to like ship like two hours, two and a half hours to reach the area. And uh, you also see there is a lot of foreign uh, developers 
you see offshore uh, uh, Austro that is from Denmark and also CIP and you see, you see the developers from Canada, from Japan and also from Germany, the WPD, the Yunnan uh, Energy Firm. So uh, that becomes uh, a, 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 an international issue at in the international investment in Taiwan, in this area. Uh, Joe, uh, yeah, for for the for the uh, for Zhanghua, for example, uh, that uh, this kind of the development make Zhanghua obviously very very busy. Um, um, yeah, as you see, there is a different for, uh, offshore wind farms. There there farm uh, wind farms here I mentioned already, and we have we still have our passageway we have our undersea communication cables to Penghu, and we have passage from the uh, uh, yeah the north south passage and then we have gas pipelines already along the coast and we have taiwan white dolphin the zhonghua white dolphin protective area like a buffer zone from miaoli to yunlin so it's a, a protective area for uh, uh, for biodiversity. And yeah, and we have a lot of overseas cables. So uh, so you see there's a sea, but under the sea, there are lots of things going on. And that's why marine spatial planning is important because different actors, different interests, they need to, uh, they share this area and uh, they need to figure a way to to manage that and that is uh, the landscape we so far we have we have the onshore constructions and this is the wind turbine uh, located in Taichung port that is close to Zhanghua ready for uh, uh, waiting for the constructions and we also have um, yeah lots of uh, harbor things yeah and yeah the, the the construction is on the way yeah and this is phase three as I mentioned uh, before, uh, the phase three is about block development, which means the government no longer um, uh, have a precisely uh, potential rights and um, and welcome the developers to 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 to, to join. Uh, in phase three, uh, the developers can um, draw their own um, preferences. Yeah. For, for the uh, for for the government to review, so um, uh, the yeah the so far the potential area the 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 yeah the the area where the government uh, where the developers are show their interests, um, it's almost all over the western coast of Taiwan. You see uh, that is in purple. So it's almost almost uh, all over the western coast of uh, yeah the the from the north from Jilong to Yunling is more or less here. So um, that could be our nearby future. It's like all our coastline area is uh, it's all, uh, all about the turbine. Yeah. So that raised up a great debate. It's like, is what we really want? Is what we really want to have? Uh, so I, I think that is, that is okay for us to uh, reach our concluding remarks. Um, what is uh, what is planning and what is the challenge of, um, of 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 this offshore wind farm development in Taiwan from the planning perspective? And uh, planning actually uh, is an issue of governance and institution uh, initiated institutional tools, a resource of implementation to guide future development. So um, even for marine spatial planning, as I mentioned in the uh, yeah like. 15 minutes ago, yeah, talking about the marine spatial planning, spatial planning in Europe, uh, the idea, the core the, of planning is to guide future development. And the future development, it, it, could, uh, it, it could be, but we don't want that. Uh, it could be all, uh, um, all, uh, all about energy. Uh, the the offshore wind farm development we want we still have something else so uh, for uh, for in this time it's very important for this collaboration to talk each other to communicate each each other so uh, now I will um, I, I will um, mention some of the challenge 
from the local perspective, from the national perspective, and also from the transnational perspectives. Uh, yeah, from the local perspectives first. Um, uh, I already mentioned in Zhanghua Overseas, actually it's very busy at this moment. There are different uh, interests, different uh, resources usage. It's like intertwined each other. So uh, there's a protest. Uh, uh, I think like a month ago or like two weeks ago, uh, it's about the fishing uh, NGOs, the fishing associations. They go to Ta they went to Taipei and say, oh, okay, um, we protect it. We 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 don't agree of that um, because for the offshore wind farm sites, there's no uh, the no fishing is allowed. So no fishing allowed, and the shipping channels is also limited fishing allowed. So and they need to um, they need to apply it beforehand. So that is very uh, very uh, unacceptable for for fishing association. So where can I do fishing? Uh, uh, how this offshore wind farm development, um, how this uh, in influences for the, our uh, existing fishing in uh, industry, our fishing fishing group, our, our living. Yeah, that is a great challenge at this moment. And if we see uh, the, 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 the offshore wind farm development and the Zhanghua coastal settlement, actually, uh, it seems there is, they are correlated only by its location. It's like only they have the territorial boundary, the administrative territories are uh, close, uh, are, uh, are in the same administrative territory. Actually, it's very far to find, very, very hard to find offshore wind farm development relations uh, with these coastal settlements. And if it is unsure, we are, uh, uh, do our interviews, the, the coastal uh, settlements, the residents, they're talking about the job opportunity, for example, but uh, the offshore wind farm is too far for them. And the, uh, they have the different techniques, different uh, skills, and it's, uh, it's kind of mismatch in this, in this sense. Okay, and uh, that is uh, in terms of the marine spatial planning, uh, actually, so far in Taiwan, we see this offshore wind farm development is really driven by the borough of energy. It's about the energy issue. Uh, it's an energy issue, and it's driven by uh, the borough of energy, Ministry of Economic Affairs, and the industry development borough. They are participate, trying to uh, to 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 um, to get the. Uh, techniques of uh, to to reach uh, to to get into the supply chain of the turbine industry, yeah. But for planning for planning sectors, uh, yeah, I would say they remain passive in this sense. Uh, for example, uh, we uh, I do a lot of review the review project for this, and you see from the planning perspective, the highest uh, sector is the construction and planning agency that it belongs to the Ministry of Interior. So, um, so uh, they are quite passive and try to um, uh, just uh, they they didn't uh, present their long term vision of this overseas area, but it's like um, we have a development project and we review it. So there are different attitudes and. That, uh, in a sense, make a difficulty for this collaboration. And, of course, we have another uh, challenge, that is the missing di uh, dialogue. They, they are not really talking to each other. They, they didn't have a, a purple framework to talk to each other. Not enough talking on the way, but we have a lot of doing. It's already on the construction. It's already operated. It's a lot of things already there but we didn't uh, have enough conversation yet. Yeah, yeah. and from planning, uh, for, for planning, um, uh, actually we have some regulations we can control, like to, to, to manage this overseas area. Uh, first of all, we have national spatial plan and each county, each uh, local government, they present, their national spatial plan. This is the national spatial plan in Zhanghua, for example. Uh, 
and you see this is really about zoning so you see there's uh, actually they really uh, draw the colors already and this is for C, uh, the, the C resource management, like uh, type one, type two, type three. Yeah, they have that. But the content of this management is quite, um, quite, quite absent, quite blurred in this sense so far. And neither the national nor the local planning sector are ready to manage the sea. Actually, uh, in tradition, uh, planning is for the land. Yeah, as I said before, planning is for the land. So when they're facing the sea, they neither have enough uh, ecological uh, resources, the platform to, to manage that, nor have enough interest to do that. So it's like, oh, it's not my business. So put it away, give it to another sectors. But they are planners. Uh, so I, I think, uh, I really think it it's, it's important. And yeah, it's time for planning to participate more active in this sense. And we have an uh, other uh, regulation, other uh, other law to to manage the, the overseas area. Uh, as I mentioned already, uh, national spatial plan, which is uh, reach the area, but uh, it's a big blur. And we have another uh, regulation, another law. It's uh, called coastal management law, and this. This law is really focused on environmental protection, like the Zhonghua White Dolphin buffers, for example. It's like uh, it's uh, it's uh, divided, it de uh, identified according to this coastal management law, and um, so uh, it's very environmental protective. Um, oriented. Uh, is uh, the law itself um, is very conservative uh, in terms of developed. In terms of the development, and the the main problem, uh, the main uh, main limit for this law is is only talking about the coastal area. And most of our offshore wind farm is located far uh, beyond this uh, this coastal area and the, the identified coastal area. So um, it's it's there is a mismatch for that, and. Actually, in 2018, in the uh, in late of 2018, uh, we approved the marine law. The marine law, uh, ideally speaking, is supposed to be um, the, the 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 highest level of regulation for this overseas area. But the detail is not yet released, so it's really on the way. And so, what we have so far is is the, the missing contact in regulations. It's, it's a great challenge in this. And that's why we have a lot of uh, protest, a lot of contradictions addressed in this area. Okay. And there's another uh, issue that is more uh, from the transboundary, like the uh, across the country, the Eastern Asia, collaboration, for example, um, there is a very, uh, the geopolitical sensitivity, there is a very, the great geopolitical sensitivities in this area. And some of the, some of the association, uh, uh, they, they, they proclaimed, maybe we need to, uh, maybe, maybe our offshore wind farm, the site, uh, the potential site is too close to the coast. Uh, and because of that, there are a lot of contradictions between the fishing association, between all these environmental protection issues. So if we, uh, they say, if we put this offshore wind farm site a bit far from the coastal area, then they, they, they release the tension. But uh, if you see the, our territorial boundary, it could be difficult, um, especially in Taiwan, yeah. In Europe, we see a lot of offshore wind farm is from the economic, uh, uh, yeah, is located in economic overseas uh, because they have the European context to uh, to collaborate. But in Taiwan, it's difficult. Um, like I mentioned before, the the so far the phase two, the uh, all stored um, offshore wind farms is actually very close to the territorial sea, uh, the line of the territorial sea already, and. If we extend it uh, out, outside, that is uh, that is very sensitive for uh, geopolitically speaking. So uh, there's also uh, a difficulties for this um, in terms of the location of the offshore wind farms, and yeah, and 
it's a bit dif difficult to 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 framing the collaboration, right? Uh, of course, in Europe uh, recently, they they the, the the world was changed. Yeah, but uh, in uh, the European Union area, supposed to be uh, they supposed to be friend to each other. Yeah, they're supposed to have the participation and have a lot of conversations in this sense. But in Eastern Asia, uh, actually, uh, there is a bit compete among the nations, among the countries. Uh, even in offshore wind farm development, it's like that. So, uh, yeah, the ge geopolitical sensitivity sensibilities of Eastern Asia makes the conversation very difficult. Yeah, okay, okay to sum up. Uh, if, uh, if you ask me, I, I will see. Uh, I will say the offshore wind farm development in Taiwan is like the jungle in the jungle. It's affluent. There is a lot of opportunities, but also very dangerous. There, uh, there is a great potential, but great risks as well. And we need timely actions. But the group of participation is not uh, is quite confusing. As I say, they uh, uh, we have a. Uh, uh, we have difficulties in terms of the regulations and so on and all these things. And uh, yeah, for me as a planner, I, I think the role of planning is crucial. But we uh, the, the planning attitude so far is like this phase. Um, we, we don't really very active for that, but uh, we need that. Yeah, I, I think we need to be that. So what, uh, but this, this all happened in this, uh, in these ten, uh, in these ten years, within a decade, so we will see, we will see what is going up. And thank you for, uh, yeah, I think that's the last slide for my presentation. Thank you for your uh, participation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Doctor Lu, for your really insightful discussion about both the European example and also like how those we can learn from for Taiwan's case. Yeah, so we can audience in the YouTube channel or our Facebook, you can type your questions in the comments area. So while we are waiting for some audience question, I would like to ask you about in Europe, sounds like they have a very mature wind energy sector. So what do you think make them successful in the European context? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think they, uh, they uh, for, for planning, uh, from planning perspective, I think collaboration is the key. Uh, yeah, because, um, yeah, of course. Um, of course, um, they 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 have a framework to talk to each other and to reduce uh, to minimize the tension. Not really reduce, but minimize. Uh, but even uh, even that, we still see some conflicts. Like in the Netherlands, uh, the fishing association they 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 back off um, from this conversation. So there is still some tensions, but. Uh, for them, it's already developed for like two decades. It's like 20, 20 years. And for Denmark, it's like 40 years, 15 years already. So I think they 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 draw they they on the ways a bit um, longer than us. So we still have a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, we have a few questions in the audience. Are you able to see the questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see one question in regards to neatly timing action. Who need to be making the timely actions and what contributions to ultimate actions? Um, uh, <laughs> what should I say? It's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I, I I think it's it will be it will be important for uh, for the government as well as for the developers, of course, um, trying to uh, figure out who are involved in this uh, in, in this kind of issue. In, of course, for offshore wind farm development, who are uh, who will be influences in the good or in the bad, uh, in the uh, positive or negative sense, and. Uh, I, I think I think to figure out who should be 
shall we communicate first? It's uh, that that's the beginning part, and then trying to uh, uh, trying to see what is the timely actions we should focus on. I think that's the that 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 is what I can respond. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, what is the current status of energy storage infrastructure in Taiwan to com uh, compensate or mitigate? Okay, the fluctuation in renewable energy power supply. Oh, good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, the the energy storage storage is another uh, great issue. So far, um, we. Uh, yeah, so far you, you know that Taiwan is uh, electricity grid is all controlled by Tao Tai Power, the company, the the semi government company Tai Power. So um, all this energy storage just also is also um, is also from in in their hands. So uh, that yes, that is very risky, and I think uh, we're trying to have some uh, small scale like household energy story like the battery to have a household energy storage trying to um uh, separate this kind of um yeah this kind of the risks thank you okay so it's about our time and thank you very much everybody for your question and thank you dr lu for your great presentation and remember this thursday we have our final lecture from another professor in taiwan She'll be talking about energy transition from across different scales. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.